Good morning, Restoration Church. It's a little loud, ain't it? Woo. Hot, hot mic. How's everybody doing this morning? We are here to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because He has made a way for you to be here. So we should be thankful for that. So what I want everybody to do, I want everybody to stand up, and we're going to get into worship. We're going to pray. Take your mind off of everything that has went around you, going on, what you got going on. We got a game later, and I don't, I, I'm not looking forward to it. We might be rolling in here later and be, in, you know, broke down. But you know what? We're going to praise God in everything that we do, and we're going to worship Him. So I want you all to worship, enjoy the worship, get into it. Be excited about it and give God the praise. Yes. Amen. Dear Lord, we just come before you tonight, God, or this morning, God, and we just want to thank you for, for what you're doing in our lives and in this church. We just ask, God, that your spirit be welcome here and allow us to praise you, God, because you are the one, God, that created us. You are the one that allowed us to be awake this morning to give us this opportunity to be in your house, to be in your house, God, and give you the praise. You deserve everything, not not ninety percent. You deserve a hundred percent of praise, dear Heavenly Father, this morning because you are awesome, you are wonderful, you are great. Yes, and I just want to thank you, God, for everything that you are doing in our lives today. In your precious name, we pray. Amen. 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 There is power 
Savior. And a little background on it, this song was written uh, over the period of about a year and a half. The first part of it was wrote, written in a season of my life where I would come to this altar and I felt like I was never breaking through. I was never, God was too far away. I just couldn't get there. I felt like I was in this dark place. And the next second verse was when I realized that that was a season in my life that I was going through and I was dealing with. And uh, all that bundled into His mercy and His grace is so beautiful and so powerful. And He's always there. He never leaves us. Let's worship Him this morning. Amen.
today we appreciate you that are so faithful it's the last Sunday of the month already can you believe that it's again I'll be writing out that rent check $800 a month we pay rent to be here we'll be making that payment this week so appreciate you that are so faithful and you're giving and we just thank God for all that he's done brother Paul would you pray and ask the Lord to bless this offering today Sing that for 20 more minutes, man. I would have enjoyed that this morning. Beautiful, beautiful. Amen. Amen. Y'all look good this morning. It's good to see everybody. Hey, if y'all need some entertainment today, about 3.30 out at the Corbin Primary School, our Restoration Men's Basketball League will make their debut. <coughs> and uh, we definitely need to have church tonight at 6 o'clock because I think some of these men probably will need prayer at the end of the day. Amen. They haven't practiced yet. They said, practice? Practice? We don't need no practice. So they're going into the game with no uniforms and no practice. Can you imagine that? That's just the way we roll. Amen? Amen. So if you need some entertainment, pray for those fellows this afternoon that the Lord would bless them. Pray for Brother Mark Barnes. He's ministering at homecoming this morning and Stinking Creek. Amen. Sounds smelly to me. I don't know about you, but uh, we want to pray for him that the Lord would, would bless him there. He'll be preaching tonight in our 6 o'clock service, Brother Mark Will. We're excited about that. But I'm just so glad to see y'all look great today. We had a great service in our 9 o'clock service this morning. And I know most people by tomorrow will be back in school. Most folks are anyway, except Willie County. I think it goes back tomorrow. Colleges are starting. Everybody's kind of getting settled in. And kind of feels like fall in the air, doesn't it? And uh, before you know it, we'll be singing uh, Jingle Bells. And here comes Santa Claus and all that good stuff. This We're going to wrap this year up real quick. And I'm already excited about Lent for next year. I'm already planning some things for that. And uh, before you know it, it's going to be Easter. And there's this man, this life just keeps rolling on, whether we want it to or not. I mean, there's no greater place to be. <clears throat> Than in the in the house of the Lord. Amen. 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 
Look at that person next to you and tell them you love them this morning. The title of my message this morning is Victory in Chaos. Wow. How many of you know what chaos means? Woo! Amen? Amen. You know, I'd like to think this morning that probably more than likely that there might have been a little chaos. Depends on how many people are in your house when you're trying to get everybody ready for church. Amen? Amen. Can anybody attest that it can be a little chaotic in the morning? Amen? Amen. Amen. If it was not, Leanne addresses me. I ain't afraid to admit it. All right. She does. She lays out my socks and everything. Because, because listen, here's the bottom line. If I'm chaotic, guess what? My whole family's chaotic. I bring chaos on my whole family. If I act crazy, my whole family responds to my craziness, right? Amen. Is that not the truth? Amen. Somebody has to be the one that can deal with it. Thank God Leanna can handle our family. I mean, she does a wonderful job in doing that. But we can have victory during chaos. And I, I don't, I'm not even going to ask you to stand today because I want to read a very familiar scripture. And we're doing our scripture memorization. For those of you that have been doing it, I've got forms for you that those of you who don't have them yet are challenging our young people to memorize a hundred scriptures here in the next month or so. And we've got some kids that are down, they only have five verses left. They've already got nine, about 90 or so close to that memorized. Our ministers were supposed to be uh, memorizing scripture and trying to match that. We've had a couple do it, but the uh, biggest majority have not. And hopefully that they'll take that challenge and step up and learn the word. How many of you think a preacher ought to know the word of God? Amen. Amen. That's kind of important. It's kind of like a mechanic know how to change oil. He ought to know how to do that, right? So uh, we, we challenge you preachers to step it up this week. But John chapter 10, verse number 10, could very easily have been one of the scriptures that we put on there. It's not. But it is a very familiar scripture that simply says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. People love to quote the first part of that verse that says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's not the most important part of that verse. It's the end of that. He says, but I come, Jesus, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Amen. And you do not have to live a life in chaos. Come on. Amen. It does not, listen, we get in a routine in life that we can go through so many things that we think life cannot be normal. We actually, listen to me now, forget what normal is. Amen. And we get so used to, there's always an empty gas tank, or there's always a floor that needs vacuum, there's always clothes that need to be uh, washed, there's always all these things that we get so chaotic that when God gives us peace in our life, we don't know how to handle it. We just look around, what's going to fall apart? What's going to happen now? Because chaos, can anybody, can anybody say amen to that? Because we live in a chaotic world. I want to take you on a journey through 1 Samuel chapter 30. If you have your Bible... Keep it open to 1 Samuel chapter 30. We're going to probably hit 25 verses. Our entire message today will be placed out of 1 Samuel chapter 30. I'll have them for the screen for you. I want to share with you a very familiar scripture. I've preached probably a half a dozen different messages through the years about King David. And when I say Ziglag, it's going to bring back a memory because those of you who have heard us sing, uh, we sing songs. Well, I went to the enemy's camp and took back what he stole from me. That old song they sang through the years, that came from David and Ziglag. Uh, there's a great message here, but there were seven strategies to victory that God gave me to share with you today because I feel like that the enemy is attacking our home. Amen. He's attacking the very fiber of what is important to us. And we, uh, we'll set it up for you for those of you that may not know this story about David and Ziglag and 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse number 1. Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziglag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziglag, attacked Ziglag and burned it, and had taken captive the women and those who were there, 
from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but carry them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city. And there it was, burned with fire. And their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him, listen to this, they lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. Has anybody in the house ever been so heartbroken that you no longer had any tears that could come out of your face? Amen. Have you ever wanted to cry and groan, but you couldn't even get the groan out because it hurt so bad? That's the way in here in the way it was here for David. Man, I feel the Holy Spirit in this place today. God's going to minister to someone if you'll listen to me. He's, they lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives, Ananom and a Jezreelite, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal the Carmelite, had been taken captive. So they come back. Here's David, all his men. As they approach the city, they see the smoke. They realize there's problems. They get closer. Their buildings are burnt down. Their kids who normally run and greet them. You know, our kids love to greet us when we come home. They come out and there's, there's dad on a horse or whatever they were in. Uh, they're not there. They're all gone. There's nothing but the fragments that remain of their life, of everything that they love, everything that they think is important to them is destroyed. And listen to verse number 6. Now David was greatly distressed. David was their leader. How many of you understand this morning, when there's a problem that takes place, people look at their leader. Now I'm sitting amongst many leaders in the house today, on your job or in your home, your managers, your leaders, you're very successful in things that you do in your life. You understand that, that I, I mentioned this morning, if something happens here on the stage when GW is up here with the praise and worship team, if a mic starts squeaking, everybody immediately does what? They look at GW to see how he's going to take care of the situation. The same as the pastor. If something was to happen right now, every one of you would look at me to see, hey, how are you going to handle that, pastor? How are you going to deal with this? When you're a leader, everybody is going to be looking at you. And sometimes as a leader, you've got to make a decision and you have to understand that decision does not just affect you, but it affects everybody around you. Come on. Amen. And the Bible says David here in verse number six was greatly distressed. For the people, listen what happened. All of his friends, all the people that loved him. The people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. The very people that were following we're picking up rocks saying, you put it, we're going to blame you. We're going to hold you accountable for this. We're going to kill you because you're the leader. What do you do when everything around you seems to be in chaos? Everything around you is falling apart. People are picking up stones. They're playing the blame game. And nobody wants to do anything but point fingers at everybody else. Here's what happened. David strengthened himself in the Lord. There's times that you're not going to have anybody else that can give you an encouraging word. There's times that no one else can help you, but you've got to pull your bootstraps up and you've got to be positive in a negative world. You've got to have victory in a chaotic world when nobody else around you understands what you're going through. So I'm going to give you seven things quickly this morning if you're taking notes. If you'd like a copy of my notes, send me a message. I'll be more than glad to email them to you. I have them in a Microsoft Word document. But I want to give you seven things this morning that will help you. Number one, when you're facing chaos, don't panic. Look at that person next to you and say, don't panic. Amen. That's the first thing we want to do is we can feel the anxiety. We can feel our hands start to shake. We can feel our headache coming on, a migraine coming on. The first thing we want to do when chaos happens is panic. we got to think all the way back to Franklin Delano Roosevelt when he said years ago in the Great Depression, the only thing that we have to fear is fear itself. 
the only thing that you need to be afraid of is yourself falling a trap to the chaos of fear in your life. You see, when you trust God, then you can say, God, I don't know what you're trying to do, but I trust in you. I'm not going to panic. I'm going to be patient. The Bible says those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings as eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and they won't faint. If we don't panic, we can allow God to make things right in our life. But what do we do? We begin to manipulate the situation. We begin to try to be God. We begin to try to work things out. We make phone calls. We, we do everything that we can to try to be God. And sometimes all you need to do in your chaos is just stop what you're doing and don't panic. Amen. It's important. Panic overtakes logic. You lose your logic in your mind when you begin to panic. You don't think straight. You begin to assume. You begin to think things that aren't even real. How many times in life have you, have you caused chaos to be in your life? Not because it was there, but because you imagined it being there. Amen. And how you get victory in chaos is, number one, don't panic. Number two, you've got to worship before warfare. You say, what in the world do you mean by that? The very next verse, verse number seven. Then David said to Abathar, the priest, who was Amalek's son, please bring the ephod here to me. And Abathar brought the ephod to David. You want to know what the ephod was? It was a garment. It was a garment that only the priest, it was reserved for the priest, and it was reserved for worship. Understand, David comes back. His children are gone. His wife is gone. Everyone has turned their back on him. And he's encouraging himself in the Lord. What's the first thing that he does? He doesn't get on Facebook and update his status. He doesn't get on social media and begin to try to defend his position. He doesn't get on the phone and begin to try to stir up controversy. He doesn't even pick up the phone and call anybody. But he goes and calls for the ephod, which was the worship. When you put the ephod on, it was a time for you to worship God. It was a time for you to yeah. give God the glory. You say, how could he do it? Because he did not panic when he found himself going through chaos. And he just began to praise the Lord. He said, God, you're good. And your mercy endures forever. Yes. Lord, I may not understand what's going on right now, but I trust in you. Yeah. He said, trust in the Lord with all your might and lean not to your own understanding. He understood that he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, yeah. you are my refuge, my God, my fortress. In you will I put my trust. He began to Praise God. Let me tell you something. The enemy will not know how to react if you would just stop in the midst of your chaos and give God praise and glory for who He is in your life. Somebody ought to say amen this morning. Well, you don't start amen to me, I'm going to tell you to slap your neighbor and wake him up because I'm telling you, I'm preaching better than you're listening. Amen. 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 Number one, don't panic. Number two, you've got to make sure your worship comes before your warfare. And number three, you need to seek godly counsel before you make a decision. Amen. Did you hear me this morning? Amen. Look at that person next to you and say, seek, seek. godly Amen. counsel. What did David do in the very next verse? Verse number eight. So David inquired of his crazy sister-in-law. No, 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 no. That's not what it says, is it? So David inquired of his great aunt Susie, who knows everything. No, that's not, that's not what it is. And David inquired of his neighbor, who'd been married five times and has four kids from three different men. Amen. No, that's not what he did, was it? Why in the world, when you find yourself in chaos, would you allow ungodly people to give you counsel on how to get through it? Why would you listen to the ungodly? Because they're not going to give you anything that you need. When David was in chaos and everything was falling apart. Listen to me. When everything was falling apart, David inquired of the Lord. Saying, 
This is what he asked him. Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him saying, Pursue, for you have surely overtaken them and without fail recover all. And David went, he and 600 men who were with him and came to the brook Bazaar. How many of you know there can be some bizarre things that happen in our life? Amen. Amen. Where they stayed, who uh, those that stayed who were left behind. The very first thing that he did was he didn't panic. The second thing he did was begin to praise and worship God. The next thing he did is he did not seek ungodly counsel, but he inquired of the Lord, what should I do? There's some of you that need to drown out every voice around you right now, and you need to find an old-fashioned altar and get on your face before God and say, God, what shall I do? You need to inquire of the Lord. You need to allow the Lord to speak to you and serve God and lean not to your own understanding. Somebody say amen. Amen. And then number four, verse, uh, verse number nine that I just read said 600 men were with him, correct? Right. Verse, uh, uh, my, my fourth point today is when others leave you, you have to keep pursuing. Amen. When others around you don't understand, you have to keep pursuing. Amen. And verse number 10, and David pursued. He and 400 men. Did I not just say there were six? Did the verse right before it not say there were 600? But yet in the very next verse, but David pursued he and 400 men for 200. Everybody say 200. 200. Stayed behind who were so weary that they could not cross the brook bazaar. You've got to stay focused And let me tell you something. I guarantee you David did not pitter-patter when he began to pursue to get his children and his family back. The Bible said that he pursued. I believe that his horse was galloping as fast as he could. I believe the tears were coming from his eyes and drying on his face mixed with the dirt and the mud as he began to get and gallop on his horse and said, I've got the blessing of God and it's time for me to pursue it. But two hundred people turned and gave up. There's going to be people in your life that don't understand what you're trying to do as a Christian. You cannot focus on them. David did not stop pursuing. He did not stop and change their diaper and give them a pacifier or give them a bottle or or lick their wounds. He kept on and he did what God told him to do because he was getting victory in the chaos that he was facing in his life. Listen, honey, you've got to stay focused. Amen. You've got to, when others leave, you keep pursuing. Amen. Number five, don't miss opportunities along the way. Amen. You listen to these next few verses. Then he found an Egyptian in a field in verse number 11. And they brought him to David. And they gave him bread, and he ate. And they let him drink water. Let me first let you understand that these Egyptians were from Egypt. They were not Israelites. They were foreigners. They looked different. They smelled different. They acted different. And David, in the middle of his pursuit of getting back the promise that God promised him he could do, stopped in the middle of the road because someone needed a miracle. Come on. In verse number 12, and they gave him a piece of cake of figs and two clusters of of raisins. So when he had eaten, his strength came back to him, for he had not eaten bread or drank water for three days and three nights. Can you imagine how he looked? Amen. Then David said to him in verse number number 13, number one, you you can't minister to anybody until you feed them and clothe them. Amen. Somebody hungry doesn't need to know how good Jesus is. We need to show them how good Jesus is. Amen. Your belly's growling. You can't hear anything but the growl of your belly. Amen. 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 And David said to him, to whom do you belong and where are you from? And he said, I'm a young man from Egypt, a servant of an Amalekite. 
and my master left me behind because three days ago I fell sick. Verse number 14, listen to this. We made an invasion of the southern area of the Cherethites in the territory which belongs to Judah. Judah is one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And of the southern area of Caleb, and we burned Ziglag with fire. David not only found himself in the presence of a foreigner, but he found himself with the very one that helped destroy everything that he had in his life. Let me tell you something. It's not about you. It's about God and this grace and mercy that we preach about. It's not just for a house. It is for everybody around us. Even if we don't believe like they believe. Even if we don't look like they don't look. They still need God. Amen. And here... He finds himself in a predicament. What would you do if the very one that took the things from you stood in your presence? What would you do if you had a chance to get revenge? Some of you need to get revenge off of your mind and let the love of God calm the chaos in your life. Amen. Amen. What did David do? He made a decision as a very wise man. Listen, verse number 15 and David said to him, can you take me to the troop? And he said, swear to me by God that you will not kill me or deliver me into the hands of my master. And I will take you down to the troop. Instead of killing the one that he had a chance to restore. He used that one to propel him to his destiny to get to where he could get victory over the enemy in his life. Quit letting the small things consume your mind and consume your heart with unforgiveness and, and with insecurities and the things that don't matter that will keep you from the root of the problem. Use those things to propel you Amen. to your victory. Amen. That's good. I don't care if anybody else thinks so. Verse number 16, when they brought him down, listen, they bring David and his men, 400 men, this Egyptian, and they went down there. There they were, spread out all over the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil which they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. David comes over the horizon and sees them gloating. How many of you know it's hard to see somebody that's hurt you laugh and rejoice? And sometimes it seems like they do it right in our face. Amen. David had a promise from God. And he was going to have victory over the chaos. Listen to what he did in verse number 17. Then David attacked them from twilight. Twilight is when the sun's going down. Until the evening of the next day. For basically 30 solid hours, David attacked the enemy. No man of them escaped except 400 young men who rode on camels and fled. When he had the opportunity, what if he would have killed the Egyptian that he met in the road when he found out that he was one of the ones that burnt his home? He would have never been able to get victory in Ziglag. Sometimes you have to choose your battles. Sometimes you've just got to let things go. Amen. Number six, you've got to take back what belongs to you. There's some of you that used to have a song in your heart that you no longer have. There's some of you that used to have joy and victory. You used to always have a smile on your face. But you've allowed the enemy to come in and attack you to take away your joy. Even though you've re received restoration. Even though everything's okay between you and God. You're not taking back what the enemy has stole from you. And if you would just understand that God has given you the victory. And he that the sun sets free is free indeed today. I am not a slave to man. Amen. I am free by the power of God. Amen. Amen. Verse number 
Verse number 18. So David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives. And nothing of theirs was lacking. Either small or great. Sons or daughters. Spool or anything that had been taken from him. David recovered all. Thank yes. God. Then David took all the flocks and the herds that were driven before them, the other livestock, and said, this is David's spoil. So he finds himself, they leave. They kill him. They take back everything that belonged to them. And they begin to make their journey back to the brook of Bazaar. Yeah. How many of you know when you get victory, the bizarre things of our life are going to be right there waiting on you? Amen. And you still have to face them. Amen. And you still have to deal with them. Yep. Amen. You still have to maintain the victory here in chaos. Amen. And verse number 21. Now David came to the two. Remember the 200 men that didn't cross the brook? Y'all remember that? He came to the 200 men who had been so weary that they could not follow David. Whom they also had made to stay in the brook bazaar. So they went out to meet David and met the people who were with him. And when David came near the people, he greeted them. Listen to verse number 22. Then all the wicked and worthless men of them who went with David answered and said, Because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered except for every man's wife and his children, that they may lead them away and depart. Man, they got all sophisticated. They got victory. They got everything back. They even had more than they had before they got there. They come to the people that were weary. And they said, listen, we'll give you your wives and we'll give you your children. But we're not going to give you anything else. You need to go on your way and find another church. Mm. Mm. You don't deserve this grace and mercy. You don't deserve the power of God. You don't deserve the same very forgiveness that God granted me in your life. Amen. And that's why churches are full of hypocrites. And churches are full of judgmental people yeah. that forget where they came from. And yeah. forget the zigzag that they went through in their life. It says here are these wicked and worthless men who were good men who fought for Israel, but they had the wrong attitude. Honey, let me tell you something. If you don't get your mind out of the chaos, you'll never have victory. Amen. Even when God delivers you, you can create chaos that's not even there. Amen. Berg, uh, chapter, or actually number seven, my seventh point today. Is you've got to give people hope. Yeah. You understand that? Amen. You have to give people hope. Right. When when you correct me, I remember in management they always taught us, you, you know, I know Nancy, y'all use a lot of different things at Walmart too. We always we're, we're trained to use the sandwich method. You take a positive, then you give the negative, and you you finish it with the positive. You do it that way for a reason. Because if all you do is give the negative, you don't give anybody any hope. There's a lot of preachers that get up and bash their people, but they don't give them any hope. They don't tell you how you can get out of the mess you're in. They don't tell you how you get out of the chaos you're in. All they do is just tell you how horrible you are and what a horrible life you are and what a horrible sinner you are and you don't have a chance. Let me tell you something. God is a God of love, grace, and mercy. And God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. You want victory over the chaos? Take that and give someone else hope. Amen. Amen. Verse number 23. And David said, My brother, ye shall not do so. For what the Lord hath given us, who has preserved us and delivered us into the hand of the troop that came against us. For we will heed you in this matter. For who will heed you in this matter? But as part is who goes down to the battle. So shall his part be who stays by the supplies. They shall share alike. So it was from that day forward. He made it a statute and an ordinance for Israel into this day. Amen. He said, listen, whether you're weary or whether you're a warrior, 
you deserve, you deserve the same reward. Amen. There's people in church that say, well, look at this one and look at that one. They don't work as hard as I do. They don't spend as much time in the church as I do. They don't do this and do about this. You turn everything into works. And you make it about works instead of about service. It doesn't matter who does the most. It doesn't matter who spends the most time. You don't do it for those reasons. And if you do it for those reasons, you cause chaos. But the one that just shows up one Sunday morning a month deserves the same grace and mercy of God for those that are here every time the door is open. Amen. David said, don't focus on what everyone else is doing. Focus on the chaos in your life and how you can get victim. Amen. See, you can look around the room today and you go, man, that guy over there is crazy. Man, that woman over there is crazy. You know what? It's a lot easier to point out everyone else's chaos instead of taking responsibility for our own. Amen. But what would happen if a group of godly people would get together and say, you know what? I can get victory over these situations in my life. Number one, I'm not going to panic. There's some of you that need to quit panicking every time the wind blows the wrong way. Every time your baby coughs doesn't mean it's dying. Amen. Amen. Every time your man smarts off to you doesn't mean he's leaving you. Doesn't mean your relationship's unfaithful. Don't let the devil put that chaos in your life. How many things in your life have you struggled with in the last 24 hours that you cannot control? Amen. Situations that you think about that consume your mind that it doesn't matter if you was a genie and, and did whatever you could do. You can't change the situation. The only thing it can do is drive you crazy. You sit around with people all around and you, the devil wants you to make so much focus on yourself that you can't help anyone else. But we can have victory over the chaos in our life. Amen. The thief comes not except to kill, steal, and destroy. But he came that you could have life. He came that you don't have to live in chaos. Right. Amen. Amen. He came that you can not only have life, but have it more abundantly. Amen. He came Amen. that not only you can have it more abundantly, you can have it better. Let me tell you something right now. If I ask you from the person that's got the most money in the bank, that's got the prettiest wife, that's got the prettiest car in the driveway, that's got the most perfect kids in the house today, every single one of us deal with chaos in our life that we don't have to deal with. Amen. I want to see you get victory this morning. Amen. I want you to stand with me all over the building if you will. We're going to open up these altars in just a moment. <coughs> There's an old song that says, take your burdens to the Lord and leave it there. Amen. If you're tired of the chaos in your life, remember the first couple of things he did. Number one, he didn't panic. Number two, he worshiped God. He sought godly counsel. There's some of you that need to shut off every voice in your head right now other than the voice of God. That's right. Amen. There's decisions that you need to make. You can't make, make your decisions based on the chaos. I preached that message a year or so ago that one of the points was don't make permanent decisions based on temporary circumstances. Amen. The things in your life that you're dealing with today, you can get victory over tomorrow. Amen. But the chaos has to stop. It's not going to be a tornado wind that God has to blow through. All he needs you to do is to trust in him with all your might. Amen. And Amen. lean not to your own understanding. You say, but this don't make sense. It don't matter because that's your own understanding. My understanding is my flesh. My understanding is failure. My understanding is sin. My understanding is thinking the worst of every situation that's going to happen. Because that's my nature as a human being. But then there's the grace and mercy of God that surpasses all understanding. And you can have peace in your heart and your life today. Lord, I thank you, God, so much for this awesome church and this wonderful time. 
that we've had together. I thank you, dear Lord, for your spirit that I have felt in this service today. I thank you, dear Lord, for each and every one that is here under the sound of my voice. Lord, you, you have prepared this message today specifically for several that are sitting in that pew that are dealing with chaos in their life and they need victory. And I'm asking you right now, Lord, to give them the strength to come to this altar and to lay it all down at your feet and to learn to understand that we will praise you no matter what chaos is happening in our life. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say, Amen. Would you come? If you feel the Lord, the Holy Spirit dealing with your heart, would you come and spend some time in the altar today? I will show.